Hallelujah. Are you all ready for some meat? Can I hear that? Amen. Uh, amen. Well, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to be ministering about the, through the prophetic word um, this, this, this evening, this afternoon. And we're going to be talking about the rapture generation. Hallelujah. How many of you know that we are the rapture generation? Yes. I said we are the rapture generation. That is a statement. When you say, well, how can you say that so strong? Because that's exactly what the Word of God says. And I'm going to walk you through the Word of God here uh, and show you this through the Word of God. How many of you know that the Word of God is the final authority? Amen. Well, the, 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 there are actually two stages or phases within the second coming of Jesus Christ. And a lot of people are not aware of that. But there are actually two comings. And to understand the Word of God, you must realize that there are two, two future comings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, first of all, we have the rapture of the church, which, very frankly, is uh, imminent. Uh, the rapture of the church, where Jesus Christ is coming for His church. Are you out there, church? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, uh, that's where we meet Him in the air. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. And then we have the return of Jesus Christ with His saints. In other words, we are with Him. Uh, and that's seven years after the rapture. What happens during those seven years? The tribulation hour. The tribulation hour and, of course, the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 19, 11 and Zechariah 14 and 4, which we will cover here very shortly. First of all, I want to explain to you that the rapture of the church is very, very near on God's calendar. We're getting down to counting a number of months. I want to explain to you, my dear people, know that no man knows the date. No man knows the time, but we do know the season and we do know the sign. And we're going to show you that sign tonight. Hallelujah. Because you see, the rapture could happen at any given moment, at any given time. A lot of people don't realize that in the prophetic word, there are actually 10,385 prophecies. And my dear people, all of those prophecies, for the most part, have been fulfilled up to the rapture of the church. That's heavy, isn't it? Okay. And we must remember, as soon as the rapture of the church happens, the rest of it is fulfilled in seven years. Like that. So it's going to happen quick. Amen? Well, hallelujah. The rapture is what? It's the literal, visible, bodily return of Jesus Christ to meet the born-again believer in the air, in the cloud. And I'm going to explain to you what to expect and what to look forward to. Amen? If you turn with me, first of all, we're going to start with the book of Acts, chapter 1. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, by the way, I use the King James uh, uh, translation of the Bible. And the reason I'm saying that is because there are a few that use the NIV. But we're using the King James this morning. Amen? Hallelujah. And in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, what we have here, we have Jesus speaking to the disciples. And what he is he saying? Well, beginning here with verse 6, he's saying, When they were they're therefore to come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times nor the seasons. You hear what I said? Okay. Hallelujah. Which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come up on you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken where? Up. He was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they steadfastly looked towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Of course, we have two angels there, don't we? Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner. So Jesus was going to come back how? The same way he left. When he went up, now he's going to come down. He's going to get us. Amen? In the air. Hallelujah. Well, my dear people, what we must realize is that living in the final generation, the body of Christ must clearly recognize the signs of the last days. How many of you know that we are in the last days? We are in the very, very last of the last days. And the body of Christ must be motivated by these signs to do more for God than you've ever done before. The church age is racing to the end of its destiny, and the age is about to close. All of the signs point to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And my dear people, the rapture of the church will take place seven years before the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
Now, I'm going to give you an example of some of these signs that the Lord has placed within the Word of God. To give an example, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, the Word of God tells us that knowledge shall be increased. If we look back 20, 50, or even 100 years, technology in the world has increased, has it not? To give an example, 50 years ago, we would not have been sitting in an air-conditioned church. We would not have ridden to church in an air-conditioned car. Maybe not even a car at all. Amen? Hallelujah. If we go back just a few more years, uh, uh, I don't even know if the wheel was round yet. Amen? Hallelujah. We see, we've seen computers and telephones and technology and fax machines and, and television cameras and, and uh, uh, transistor radios and, and satellites and rockets and you name it. All in this, this last generation, this last 100 years, if you like. Yeah. And you know what, my dear people? All the thousands of years before that, hardly anything. And all of a sudden, things were speeding up. Why? Because God said, knowledge shall be increased in his last days. In uh, Daniel 12, verse 4. And then Jesus said in Matthew 24, 11, he says, Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. We see in our, in our schools today, we see the teaching of evolution. We see Jehovah's Witnesses walking down the street. We see Mahomormons walking down the street. We hear about New Age. You turn on the TV at night, it's New Age. You know, my dear people, what's on there? New Age. We see, you see false religions and gurus uh, with long beards and all this abound. In other words, and that's what Jesus meant when many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. The apostate church uh, uh, is being made ready for a one world religion. And my dear people, people are deceived. Deceived. People are deceived. And that's the reason why Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, he says, let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 6, he says, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, my dear people, we are seeing wars, terrorism, unrest in the world as never before. If you don't think so, turn on the 6 o'clock news when you get home. Or the 10 o'clock news, it'll change again. Amen? You better believe it. Hallelujah. In, in Matthew 24, 7, Jesus said, And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. In other words, in diversified places. Do you know that we as the body of Christ and the world out here have actually gotten so numb to what's going on in the world out here as far as earthquakes and pestilences and famines, we think if they're not in our own backyard, well, it's just not happening, is it? Jesus said in diversified places. You may have earthquakes in California, but you may have tornadoes in Texas. But if you notice, they're all speeding up. Amen? Amen? You may have a, 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 a hailstones and things of this nature that, that didn't used to happen, did it? That's right. Or we have famines and pestilences. Maybe you don't have them here, but you have them in other countries. And Jesus was talking about the global community, not just the United States of America. Amen? Hallelujah. And Luke 28, uh, Luke 21, 28, Jesus said, And when these things... Uh, what things? The things he's talking about here begin. Did you hear me, my dear people? They begin to come to pass. Not when they come to pass. When they begin to come to pass, look up your redemption draweth nigh. In other words, he wants to redeem our body, dead or alive. I can see a wanted poster hanging on the wall. Wanted, Christians, dead or alive, by Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's what you call the rapture. Amen. Hallelujah. So you see, in Hebrews 1, 2, the Word of God says, God hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Amen? And He's telling us to establish this in our hearts. If you turn with me, please, to James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, in beginning with verse 1, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In James chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, the Word of God says, Go, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Well, how does gold and silver eat your flesh? I'll tell you how. Put all your money into it, and let the bottom fall out of it in the market. Eat your flesh real quick. <laughs> you better believe it. Amen? Hallelujah. Why? Because we're supposed to put our trust in God, not gold and silver. You better believe it. What does the Word of God say? It says, invest in the kingdom of God. Amen? Hallelujah. It says uh, in verse 3, You have eat treasure up together for the last days. You see that word last days? He's talking about the last days here. And he says, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cry, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. That's the rich robbing the poor. 
The rich robbing the poor. Verse 5, you have lived in Pfizer on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. In verse 7, where God says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. So what's he talking about here? Coming of the Lord. He says, Be patient, therefore, church, or brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, which is God, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, which is what? The harvest. Amen? And hath long patience for it until what? He, who? God, receive the early and the latter rain. You say, what do you mean? For he received the early and latter rain. We're praying for the early and latter rain. My dear pain, my, my dear people, the early and latter rain, which we're talking about the latter rain now, is intercession. That's what intercession is all about. Did you know that? Why does he call it rain? Because it works the same way. When we go to prayer and intercede, what happens? Those prayers go up to heaven and they begin to accumulate. And they begin to accumulate just like moisture from the earth accumulates. And when God has his appointed time, he pours out that rain upon the earth and brings in the harvest. And that's the purpose of intercession, you see, my dear people. People don't realize the importance of intercession. But that's exactly what he's talking about when he's talking about he is waiting for it. God is waiting on it. He's waiting on us. Amen? He's waiting on us. We're sitting here saying, Oh God, send the rain, send the rain. He's saying, I'm waiting on it. Amen? I'm waiting on it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, the Word of God says in, in um, 1 John 2, 18, Little children, it is the last hour. It is the, the last hour. But in James chapter... Uh, I forgot to hear about James chapter 5. Uh, verse 8, it says, uh, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. And the Lord is telling us this morning, Be established and patient your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Be ye also patient and establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Hallelujah. In 2 Timothy 3, 1, the Word of God says, In those last days perilous times will come. Perilous times, church. You say, well, what do you mean by that? If you leave this country, you'd be shocked as a Christian. Just before we left London, I can tell you that there was a preacher that was placed in prison in Denmark, in the European community. And you say, why? What was he doing? What did he do? Go out and rob a bank? No. He stood up and preached against homosexuals. And he's in prison. Huh? That's right. It's coming, people. Get ready. First John 2, 18, the Word of God says, little children, it is the last hour. He says, why, do you, why does the Lord keep saying it's the last hour? Because he wants to establish this in your heart, my dear people. Time is running out. And you're going to see how tort, short time is by the time I get through here. In 2 Peter 3, 3, the word of God says, Mockers and scoffers will come in the last days. Hallelujah. The signs are here. Turn with me quickly to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Hallelujah. What we have in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 is the rapture of the church. John the, the Apostle is here. He's been taking notes from our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you notice here in verse 1, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you these things which must be hereafter. Hereafter what? The rapture. He begins this, this, the paragraph with, after this. After what? After God has shown him and dealt with the, the church in the first three chapters in the book of Revelation. He says, after this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I what? Heard. Heard. As it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither. Come up hither. My dear people, the signs are here, and it is time to listen for the sound. Did you hear me? It is time to listen for the sound. It's time to listen for the voice that sounds like a trumpet saying, Come up hither! Come up hither! It is time to listen for the sounds, my dear people. He says in verse 1, he says, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, which is the rapture of the church. It is time to listen for the sounds. Why? Because the trump is about to sound. The trump is about to sound, my dear people, and the sound of the door is beginning to open. He says, and it's time to listen for the sounds. 
If you turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to show you another sign that the Lord give us uh, in chapter in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to begin with verse 1. And this is where uh, Peter is writing to the church, and he says, This second epistle, beloved, talking to the church, I now write unto you, in both which uh, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. In other words, Peter the apostle here is saying, Hey, church, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember something. He says, That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. In other words, uh, look at the prophecies, uh, listen to the prophets. Uh, why? Listen to me. And, and the commandment of the apostles and of the Lord and Savior. He says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts uh, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? What coming? His second coming. For since the Father fell asleep, in other words, through all the ages, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of the God of heavens. We're of old and the earth standing out of water and in water, talking about creation, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, talking about the days of Noah. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Verse 8, and boy, is this a key. We're going to study this in a minute. But, beloved, talking to the church, emphasizing, but, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Then he goes on, he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. What promise? The promise of his second coming, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. How many of you know that God is not a liar? He says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In other words, by surprise, we're not going to know what hits us in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye be in all holy conversation and godliness? He's saying, Be ye holy, for I am holy, because I'm coming. How many know that Jesus, how many of you know that we are the bride of Christ? How many of you know at this right moment we are engaged to Jesus? We are his betrothed, and he's not coming back for a bride with a dirty dress, church. He's not coming back for a bride with a dirty chest, a dirty dress. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. He's saying, be holy, for I am holy. Yes. Verse 11 says, uh, and, and seeing then, sorry, verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with her fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, his promise is second coming, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Hallelujah. Most of the church don't realize that we're going to live in a new heaven and a new earth right here on the earth. A new recreated earth. A new recreated Jerusalem. In the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace uh, without spot uh, and blameless. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the key to the whole text is verse 8. Verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. He doesn't say two or three or four or five. He says this one thing. That one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. You see, the book of Psalm tells us in chapter 90, verse verse 4, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday. In other words, one day. You see, one day to the Lord is the same as a thousand years. And a thousand years is as one day. You know, the book of Revelation is written in chronological order, which means as it has happened. And Bible chronology shows us uh, that a little less than 6,000 years have passed since Adam. What is Bible chronology? It is a science of measuring time. You say, well, what does this mean? God is giving us a glimpse of his plan. Why? So that we will be prepared for the second coming. What's he talking about here? The second coming. 
When he said in 2 Peter 3, 8, he said, that, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. You say, well, what's he saying? When you study the Word of God, the Lord shows you that from Adam to Abraham was 2,000 years. Day one, day two. From Adam to Jesus was 2,000 years. Day three, day four. From Jesus to now, is 1,995 years. Day five and almost six. The millennial reign of Jesus Christ is a thousand years. Day seven. You say, what do you mean, Ron? God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. Hallelujah. God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. Six days equals 6,000 years. In other words, the first 2,000 years were days 1 and 2. The second 2,000 years, days 3 and 4. The third 2,000 years minus 5 years is days 5 and 6. My dear people, we are at the very end of the sixth day. Did you hear me? We are at the very end of the first, I mean the sixth day. The door is about to close on the church age as we know it. Did you hear me? The door is about to close on the church age, and the door is beginning to open in heaven. Revelation 4.1. We just read it. The door is beginning to open in heaven. Revelation 4.1. My dear people, the Holy Ghost is telling you it's time to listen for the sound. It's time to wake up, church. It's time to listen for the sound. We're down to a number of months. No, no man can set the time or the date. I may say date with that good-looking redhead out there, but uh, <laughs> who's my wife? Amen. But not the wife. The Word of God. Amen. You see, if we reverse the time span, for instance, for before the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ can happen, what has to happen? The second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming happens when His feet touch down at the Mount of Olives, which is also the battle of Armageddon. Turn with me please quickly to Revelation 19. We'll show you this in the Word of God. In Revelation 19. Hallelujah. Did y'all learn anything? Amen. In Revelation 19, beginning with verse 11, what we have here is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Beginning with verse 11, now if you notice here, he says, And I saw heaven opened. Here we see another door opening. You notice that? I saw heaven opened. Another door. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. How many of you know that that's Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. That's the second white horse. The first white horse had, had a false Messiah who was pretending, uh, pretending to be good when he was not. But this is the second one. He says, And I saw in heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called what? The, the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen and white and clean. That's us, my dear people. That is the church. That's the church clothed in the righteousness of God. And we go with him to where? To the battle of Armageddon which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we are with him upon white horses. Turn me, please, to Zechariah 14. We'll show you that. Hallelujah. Zechariah 14. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my dear people, he's coming. Woo! Glory be to God, he's coming. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Zechariah chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. Hallelujah. Y'all got it. Verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. You see that there? Verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. What is that? That's the battle of Armageddon. 
and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished and half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city verse 3 then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations that's 1911 Revelation 1911 as when he fought in the day of battle my dear people okay, the army is already formed that will come against Jesus Christ and his church it's already formed did you know that? The name of it is called Eurocorps. It previews October 1995 in Europe. Already in place, already formed, it previews October 1995 of this year. That is the army of the European nations that will, the Antichrist will head up and come against Jesus and his church at the Battle of Armageddon. Already in place. Verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day where? Up on the Mount of Olives. You see, that is the second coming. The second coming happens when his feet touch down and upon the Mount of Olives. The rapture of the church is when we meet him in the air. His feet don't touch down. There's two comings. Amen? Okay. Uh, verse 4 goes on. It says, Which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the west, therefore toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall move to the north and toward the south. In other words, there's a big earthquake. If you look there in the, verse, the very last sentence of verse 5, the Lord of God says, And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Glory be to God, we get to be there. Hallelujah. Did you hear me? We get to be there. That's a, that's a fulfillment of Revelation 19, 14. We just read it. We are with him, clothed in fine uh, linen and white to the righteousness of God. Amen. We are white uh, with him. So you see... We have the thousand-year millennial, millennial reign of Christ. Before that happens, the second coming has to happen where his feet touch down at the Mount of Olives. You got that straight now? Which is also the battle of Armageddon. Before that happens, what happens? The seven years of tribulation. The seven years of tribulation where we have three and a half years of peace. Please remember that the Antichrist comes upon a peace, a peace platform as a man of peace. And he will be a man of peace for the first three and one half years. In mid-tribulation, he will break that peace agreement to Daniel 9, 27. He will break that peace agreement with Israel and become a man of war. And that's when the, the red horse is loosed, Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is World War III. Hallelujah. You say, well, how close is that? Well, my dear people, <clears throat> how many of you see on TV about Croatia and Bosnia? You, are you aware that they are involved in that battle that Ezekiel 38 and 30, 39 talks about? So is Iraq, Iran, Sudan, Ethiopia, Libya. How many have heard of Saddam Hussein? How about Omar Gaddafi? They're all lining up, aren't they? Glory be to God. Settle it in your hearts, people. Time's short. We're in the last days. We are the rapture generation. Amen? Turn me, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 16, we see the rapture. You say, well, what is the rapture? Well, you don't find the word rapture in the Bible, do you? A lot of people say, well, what? I, don't, I can't find the word rapture in there. Well, let me ask you something. What is this? Is this a Bible? I can't find the word Bible in here either. <laughs> but we call it a Bible. Amen. Why? Because you see, the rapture is a catching away or a snatching away of the church, and that's what we call it. Amen? Hallelujah. So we see the rapture of the church in verse, uh, uh, beginning with uh, verse 16 of chapter 4. And the Word of God says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, Amen? With a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with what? The trump of God. The trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, who? Which are alive. How many live ones we got out here? <laughs> oh, we got, a, we got a house full. Hey, Amen. I'm glad there's no dead ones in here today. Hallelujah. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. With who? The dead in Christ. In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You see that there? And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the rapture of the church where we meet him in the air. You see? Well, how many of you know when the Word of God was written, it wasn't written in chapter and verse, it was written in epistles and letters. You see, if you notice there in verse 18, Paul the Apostle says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Why? Because the church, the church was getting a little bit shook up about this rapture thing going around. 
Verse 18 says, But wherefore comfort one another with these words? Because you see, when, when uh, Paul the Apostle wrote to the Thessalonians, uh, he continued on writing, which was actually chapter 5 in our Bibles, but it's a continuation of the letter. And he says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, talking to the church, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, how many know what the day of the Lord is? That's the last days, the tribulation hour. Okay? So come up as a thief in the night. Hey, you know when a thief comes in the night, you don't know it. He comes by surprise. Remember that word, by surprise. But when they shall say, who? Israel. When they shall say, who? Israel. Peace and safety, then sudden destruction come up upon them. Who? Israel. My dear people, what are they saying this very moment? What are they saying? Peace and safety. Peace and safety. And it says, then sudden destruction come up upon them as travail cometh upon a woman. How many of you know that when travail come upon a woman, or in other words, childbirth, uh, you're not going to stop it? Huh? You're not going to stop it? And that's what, so the Word of God is saying, hey, people will say, well, that peace agreement might stop. It's not going to stop. The Word of God just told you it's not going to stop. It's, when it, once it starts, it's going to be just like the travail of a woman, it's going to come. And that's the reason why you see such pains going on in the Middle East for this peace agreement to be born. It's in travail. It's in travail. It's birthing this peace agreement because it's in the Word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Verse 4 says, But ye brethren, talking to the church, are not in darkness, that that day should take you as a thief. Why? Because we're born again. We're full of the light. We have got God's Word. We've been told. You're being told right now if you haven't been. And you are the children of the light and children of the day and are not of the night nor of the darkness. Hallelujah. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. In other words, pray and intercede. That's what that word watch means there. For they that sleep in the night, sleep and, uh, uh, in other words, they're in darkness and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. They're lost. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and of the helmet of hope for salvation. And I love verse 9. You listen to this, church? You got your you got your ears open, your spiritual ears, and your huh? For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Hallelujah! <laughs> God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. Then He says, verse ten: Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, in other words, whether we're alive or dead, we're going to be living together with Him. In other words, talking about the rapture. Hallelujah! We're not subject to wrath, my dear people. Hallelujah. God has not appointed us to wrath. That's the reason why Jesus is saying in, in, in 16, Matthew 16, 3, He says, Can you not discern the signs of the times? Can you not discern the signs of the times? My dear people, it is time to listen for the sounds. I can remember when I was in high school, they had a, they had a frog. And we had this science class. And they took a, two beakers of water. And one beaker, they, they, they heated it up, boiling. And the other one, they just left it cold. And they'd take that frog and drop it in that hot, scalding water. Man, that thing would jump out of there quick. He would jump quick. But they'd take that same frog and put him in that cold water and turn on the fire and let it go up slowly, and he cooked. And that's what's going on in the world today. It's cooking. Because it's slowly... The old devil keeps turning up the heat. Huh? They think it's the way of life. You better believe it. They don't know how to get out of it. How do you know we know how to get them out of it? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In Hosea chapter 9, verse 10, we won't turn to it, but the Word of God says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree. How many of you know that Israel is a fig tree? Just like Great Britain is the lion in the Bible, America is the eagle. If you want to find it, start looking under eagle. You'll find it. Our wings of eagles, things of this nature. Hallelujah. So we're going to start looking here at another sign or two. But Jesus gave us a sign, a big sign, and it's Israel. You know, how many of you ever been to the Mount of Olives? You ever been there? It's come through the news media that there is an old dead olive tree there that's been dead for 2,000 years. If you heard this, it's beginning to bud. Glory be to God. It's beginning to bud. It's been dead there for 2,000 years. You'd think it'd be petrified, wouldn't you? It's beginning to bud. Glory be to God. You think things aren't close? 
Hallelujah. Turn me please to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you know that Jesus was a prophet too? He walked in the office of a prophet. Hallelujah. In Matthew 24, what we see here is... Well, hang on. Thank you, Jesus. I was in Luke. <laughs> in Matthew 24, we see we're talking about the Mount of Olives. Jesus and the disciples are sitting upon the Mount of Olives. And they're talking about signs of the end times. And beginning with verse 3... Well, we'll start. It says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, uh, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Talking about the end times. Tell us, uh, he asked three questions. Tell us when shall these things be? And two, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Which is the third question. If you notice there, he says, in those three questions, he says, Tell us when these things shall be. And two, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Sign, it's singular. Singular, not plural. Not signs. Amen? He's emphasizing a sign. Well, what is that sign? Well, we're going to keep reading here. I'm going to show you where we're at on the prophetic clock. And Jesus answered and said to them, first thing he said was, Take heed that no man deceive you. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. I'm sorry, I want to go back to verse 5. It says, And many shall come in my name, saying that I am Christ, and shall deceive many. It's interesting to note here, and, you, and if you have a King James, the word Christ in that verse right there may be in italics. And it may not. But in the original Hebrew or Greek text, it was not even in the Bible. It's, it, what it said was, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am, and shall deceive many. I'm going to ask you something. Who runs around saying I am? New age. New age. So he's saying, Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation. And it's also interesting to note that that word nation there is talking about ethnic tribes. Not nations. And what do we see going on in, in, in Bosnia? Ethnic cleansing. Amen? And kingdom against kingdom, that's light against darkness. And there shall be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. We're all familiar with that. As soon as we go home, turn on the news, it's there. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. All these are the beginning of sorrows. My dear people, that's where we are at right now on the prophetic time clock. We're stuck on verse 8. That's where we're at. You say, well, how do you know that? Verse 9, you see, uh, is talking about Israel from verse 9 forward. The church is raptured right here at verse 8. You might want to make a little mark in your Bible. Verse, verses, uh, uh, Matthew 24, verses 9 through and inclusive of 14 is the first three and a half years of the tribulation hour. Verses 15 through... And inclusive of verse 26 is the second three and a half years of the tribulation hour. Read it. You'll see it. And verse 27 is the second coming. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You see that there? So you see, he was talking to Israel. When he's talking to the disciples, he wasn't talking to the church. He was talking to Israel and he was talking to them about Israel. And that's the reason why he said, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Singular. We have many, many signs in the world, but he says these signs. He's talking to Israel. And, if, and, and he gives us that sign in Matthew 24, verses 32 through 34. And he tells it in a parable. And he says, now I'll learn a parable of the fig tree. How many of you know that Israel is a fig tree? When his, his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that sim summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Where's it at? It's at your door. Huh? It's at the door. It's near. At the door. So likewise, when you see these things, know it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass 
What generation? The generation that has witnessed the restoration of Israel. Who is that generation? We're it, people. We are the rapture generation. We are the rapture generation. Did you hear me? A lot of people say, well, how long is the generation? Is it 40 years or is it 100 years or what is it? When you study the, the Bible, you'll find that if you take every generation in the Bible and throw it into a computer or what have you, it comes out and divides it all out. How many generations and how many this and how many that? It comes out to 51.9 is the average generation. The generation in the Bible is 51.9 according to just about every Bible scholar you'll talk to. Well, Israel was made a nation on May the 14th of 1948. How many of you know that? May the 14th, 1948. If you take 1948 and add 51.9, I mean, add 51 you come out to 1999.9. My dear people, you cannot get much closer to the year 2000. Amen? Or the end of the sixth day. The end of the sixth day. It's time to listen for the sounds. It's time to listen for the